and sorry sorry steve it is a lot of names oh wonderful <laughs> yeah <laughs> welcome back yeah, yeah. <laughs> i can yeah. tell he's excited <laughs> and i'm gonna try it at for part the first part of it read uh, i think a, one of these things i'll have to get it open it has a few descriptions on some of the people uh that he lists um before we get into the questions um and some of them you've heard about uh there's some other names which let alone not being able to pronounce you've probably never heard of before but uh so here oh, we kind of like kind of like Thessalonians and Colossians huh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, describe briefly your first best friend and what old friends do you keep in touch with why and how often? Well, I'll start off with, when I found this question uh, to use on when discussing this passage, um, I actually I thought about my grade school best friend and uh, so sent him a text uh, right, right then and uh, asking how he's doing and everything else. So, um, We've actually kind of uh, made contact and uh, actually back from Facebook when I used to be on Facebook, but uh, so kind of kept in contact and uh, he lives in uh, uh, Utah and uh, he's not, not Mormon, but uh, he lives amongst them, so. That's I've, stayed in, I've stayed in contact with old high school buddy, grade school buddy. I mean, we grew up together in the same neighborhood. Uh, East, uh, so, I mean, it, when you mention it, I mean, it isn't, wouldn't it be new for me to, we stay in constant contact continually. Both he and his wife were in my high school class. And um, so we're close, still close. I mean, uh, and I've, he's, he went to Vietnam, came back from Vietnam, uh, just uh, have always been very close. And are we, uh, my high school class, when you go to a small town, high school classes seem to be pretty close. And so our old class is uh, pretty close as it goes to that. We, have, we actually have a 60th reunion coming up next year. And we have a really good turnout on those. And uh, I and about five other people head that up and, uh, uh, we really don't have any problems with attendance. It's usually pretty darn good. Well, great. Most, of my old, most of my old friends are just. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the, they start uh, dropping off at some point. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, us too. It's kind of every year, you know, Chucky, you count on who's not coming. To yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of moved in and got into the, uh, you combined the second question too. When was the last high school reunion you you went to and how did you feel? Well, I noticed when you brought them up, you put two up first, then one. So I thought maybe. I, I know, it's <laughs> not, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't re-sequence. Um, well, I went to my 50th and it was great. I'm also on the planning committee. We had a class of 1,100 people. Um, and we had probably uh, 250 show up, which wasn't bad. Oh, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Our class, uh, we had 10 couples that got married out of our class. Mm. Wow. Uh, my wife and I being one. And uh, we are very active. I think we have about, we only had 127 in a class, but I think uh, about 50 show up all the time. So it's a good response. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> Anybody else, any other comments on best friends, reunions? Well, Rick quit high school, so you can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I went right to college. I skipped <laughs> high school. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, Rick, this is your part here. All right, here we go. Paul continues with typical with typical of the conclusions of the, his letters, commendations of 
fellow worker, exhortations to greet other Christians, greetings to the Roman Christians from others. But what is not typical about this section is the number of greetings. He asked the Romans to greet 26 individuals, two families, and three house churches. This number is all the more surprising when we remember that Paul had never visited Rome. Paul touches quickly on many different topics as he brings the letter to its conclusion, most of which are common in the endings of Paul's letters. But two are not. The warning about false teachers in chapter 16, 17 through 19, and the concluding doxology in 16, 5 through 27. All right, uh, Steve, there's two pages here. Uh, the first one is probably the worst. And uh, uh, <laughs> you have mercy and grace from all of us as you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not a church, so this is pretty good. You guys are forgiving. <laughs> I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Sencria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need for, from you. For she has a great help. She has been a great help to many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Anandronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, who I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus, Stachus. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the house of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Nar Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trif Trif Trifina and Trifosa. These women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me, too. Wow, okay. Greet yeah. <laughs> Asnicritus, Phlegon, Hermes, and Patrobus, Hermes and the brothers with them. Greet Philagus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as does Lucius, Jason, and Sasa Potter, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. I guess we know the author now. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole world church here enjoy, send you his greetings. Aristus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to, whom, to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery of hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings of the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, thanks, uh, Steve. That was, that was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That deserves for, a round of applause. Yeah. Right yeah. Tell you. Yeah. So uh, I won't even do them as well when I go try and tell you who these people are. So, <sighs> The uh, couple of interesting things on, on this 
part of the passage is one uh, J.B. Phillips, which is an English translator of the New Testament, instead of, uh, I guess he wasn't comfortable with greet one another with holy kiss, and he says greet one another with a hearty handshake. Oh. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of the translations don't even include uh, verse 24, uh, the New King James Version. So uh, that's why that was there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So I guess it, they deleted it because they thought it was repeated here. It wasn't in every translation. So, uh, so I just inserted that here because it wasn't in the NIV. Okay, what I'm going to try and do here is uh, kind of interesting that Tertius put wanted to write something of his own in there, right? I yeah. Tertius could. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, he, he was, uh, Paul was uh, dictating to him. So Right, right, right. And I can't imagine uh, how Paul, how quickly he read and everything else. So, um, so I think we, we all know, I'm going to kind of go down these on this one. I got one translation open here on another screen. Um, and I'll kind of move you guys over here a second. Uh, everybody knows uh, Phoebe, my daughter. Uh, she, but she was a a, fair, a wealthy woman, and uh, she was actually kind of the uh, she's a, a carrier of the messages of God, or actually what uh, some people refer to her. But she she was uh, delivering uh, this letter to Rome. Um, uh, Priscilla was a diminutive form of Pr Priscilla. Pris Prisco. She and her husband Aquila, which was Eagle, were tent makers like Paul. They were not only business partners, but partners with him in ministry. Uh, go down. Uh, Epinetus, praiseworthy. Um, well, I think it always, who was the first convert, convert to Christ in the Roman province of Asia. Uh, let me see. Miriam or Mary, as uh, the Hebrew name Miriam is taken from the old Hebrew root. You're gonna, no, wait, let's see. Well, that doesn't tell us much about her, except she toiled and labored extremely hard. Uh, let's see. Uh, on Dronicus and Junia throughout the first 1200 years of church ministry at Dron Dronicus, which means victorious ones, and Junia, youthful, were considered to be husband and wife. A small number of manuscripts have Julia. Uh, Paul calls them his relatives or Jewish kinsmen, maybe the aromatic meaning of uh, Junia's little dove. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this, that, this may be kind of uh, laborsome, but I thought some of this was interesting. Um, Amplidius was a common name given to slaves. It means large one. So um, I got to move you guys out of the way further. Let's scooch over a little bit. Okay. Like going to the first family reunion with my wife on her side. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. I mean, all these people you're meeting and hearing about, and then you walk away and you have all these questions about them. Yeah. Jeez, we feel... uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a common name, a slave. Uh, he's believed to have... Um, Eastern Orthodox Church recognizes him as one of the 70 disciples who Jesus sent out. I thought that was interesting. Uh, he's believed to have become the Bishop of Bulgaria. Um, Urbanus was a common name given to slaves. It means polite one. Uh, What's amazing is to think about Paul, who actually, you know, repeated all this. Did he have a book he read from, or did he do this from memory? It was on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Zacchaeus, uh, Stacus, I don't know how you said that. I should have 
listen closer to how you pronounce them, Steve. He is said to have been one of the, and again, another one of the 70 disciples Jesus sent out. So uh, eventually became the Bishop of Byzantium. Uh, greet the uh, Apelles, the called one. And then I think Paul talks about he's been tested and found to be approved by the anointed one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Archibolus House Church um, uh, are those of our, our Archibus who's uh, by implication, those connected to that household, his house, house church. The word household is not found in the Greek text, but uh, means um, his name means best counselor. Traditionally is known as one of these. And again, um, seems like a number of these are part of the 70 that Jesus sent out. So I guess they went all, it sounds like they went all the way to Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he might have gone beyond there. It looks like he said uh, he's one of the 70 and he brought the gospel to Britain. Wow, this guy's reached a little further than we thought. And Herodian um, <clears throat> name means heroic and he was traditionally considered, again, a number one of the 70 disciples, I guess a group of them just must have gone on to Rome. So he later became... Bishop of Neoparthia in Iraq, where he was beaten to death by Jews, but was resurrected and continued to preach the God. Wow. I guess I need to get into that a little bit more in depth, but uh, was resurrected and continued to preach the gospel. It is believed that he was eventually beheaded in Rome on the same day Peter was martyred. Um, you know, some of these ones. Okay, Narcissus uh, are those of Narcissus means maybe the household or family. Although early, nearly every translation adds the word household. It is not found in the text. By implication, this would be those meeting as a church in his house. Narcissus name means astonished. And some have identified him as a close friend of the emperor Claudius. Um, this is Tryphena and uh, uh, Tryphosa are might have been twins. Some have identified her as Antonio Tryphena, the princess of Bosporan kingdom of Eastern Crimea and connected with the queen of Thrace. This would mean she was royal and wealthy. And Tryphosia can also mean living luxuriously or, or triple, threefold shining. Some scholars believe that Tryphenia and Tryphosa were twin sisters born into royalty. Um, to uh, Perseus, Perseus, to be taken by storm, and she was a woman from Persia, Iranian background, who was a godly servant and passionate follower of Jesus. And Rufus, it is believed that he was the son of Simon of Cyrus, Olivia, who helped Jesus carry his cross to Calvary. So uh, that experience when uh, Simon was called out to carry Jesus cross had an impact on his whole family. So um, let's see, uh, sinners. Uh, the Orthodox Church recognizes him as an apostle. He became the bishop of the Church of Hyrasi or Turkey. In this verse, Paul joins five men together. They could have represented the fivefold ministry, if you remember that, um, or they may have been leaders of house churches, for there were others who were with them and connected to them. Um, Phylagon means uh, burning one. He was considered to be one of the 70. Uh, the Orthodox Church recognizes him as an apostle who became the bishop of Marathon and Thrace. Uh, Armenes mean preacher of the deity, and he was considered to be one of the 70. There's a big group of the 70. 
uh, sent out by Jesus and later the Bishop of Dalmatia. Um, but Trobas means uh, fatherly. He likewise was one of the 70 sent out by Jesus and later become the Bishop of Neopolis. And uh, Hermas was one of the 70 and later became the Bishop of Bulgaria. They were, there are interesting traditions surrounding Hermas. He is said to have said he was a very wealthy man, but fell into poverty because of his sins. He was visited by an angel of repentance who accompanied him for the rest of his life until he was martyred. There are writings known as the Shepherd of Hermas that some scholars attribute to him. And let's see. The, uh, some of these, the Philogus, Julia, Nerissus, and his sister, also Olympus. Let's see, they're all kind of grouped together here in these descriptions. Oh, let me find that. Oh. Now I lost my place because when I expand this click, uh, it moves me. Yeah. I know, I'm sorry. The, uh, what verse was I on? Uh, a centrist means uh, incomparable. The Orthodox Church represents uh, him as an apostle. He became the bishop of, we already read that one. Okay. Oh, here this, here's I am. Uh, Phil Logos means talkative. He was recognized as the Orthodox, by the Orthodox Church as an apostle of Christ. It is likely that Julia his, was his wife and Neroas and his sister were their children. Olympus means heavenly, and the Orthodox Church recognizes Olympus as an apostle who was murdered by, who was mur mentored, mentored, not murdered, I can't read, mentored by Peter, and was beheaded, beheaded the same day Peter was martyred in Rome. Philogus and Olympus apparently had a measure of influence over a number of believers in the faith, majority of the people named in this chapter were not Jewish, and many of their names indicate they were former slaves. God bless and uh, anoint anyone who turns in faith. And okay, sorry, but I found some of that interesting. So um, I hope there's not a test on this. I <laughs> you weren't taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> So what, what kind of things does Paul command in the persons mentioned in verses 1 through 15? And what does this say about how we ought to judge success, whom we ought to choose as friends? Can you reread that for me, Dwight? Pardon? Can you reread that entire thing for me so I can answer that question? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can't see it. What kinds of things does Paul and the person? Why do you want me to hold, read that whole passage? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess you have to see if other people can get that answer. Is it underlined where I can read from that or anything to get the answer? No, there is a question where I have color coded. But yeah. uh, so you can't see that either. No, I'm I sorry. would say to answer fellow workers in the kingdom, fellow workers in the kingdom, people kind of had a, a, these relationships he built in his uh, working relationship, I guess, um, mm -hmm. and ministering to Christ. So, um, so 28 individuals are mentioned uh, in Paul's greeting, 26 by name. It is a diverse group of males, females, slave, freedmen, Jews, Gentiles, well-to-do and well-thought-of. Looking at this uh, list, how balanced would you say Paul was in his friendships with both genders? And remember, back then, there were only two genders. <laughs> I'll use a word we often hear today. He was very inclusive. Yes, yes. This kind of reminds me of what's going on in China with the underground church and people meeting in households and yeah, right. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that kind of reminds me. I don't know whether uh, we were in something or we heard somebody talking about it, or maybe it was just something I I was listening to a, a podcast from somebody, but they they talked about kind of uh going over uh, and kind of meeting with some of the people in the underground churches uh over there and and um and the people over there asking uh, the people to pray for them and uh and the the ministers from uh the uh, missionaries from uh, america said well, no, we'd like you to pray for the church in America because your how how your faith has uh, persevered in, in these circumstances and meeting secretly. Um, you know, our church does not have that uh, that faith or strength that you have. So please pray for us. So, um, so how many do you think are were women of this uh, list? And what roles did, did these women have in the church? <sighs> it could be a clue for those that you can see the screen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nine. Ten. One, two, three, four. Well, no, it's, that's nine. On nine, it's, that's what I think I had. Oh, did you include Phoebe at the beginning? Yes. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, I see ten colored, but okay, yeah, it's well, it's ten. It must be ten then, because it... unless I counted wrong, anybody else see ten? Got ten. Okay. No, it's ten. Okay, so ten out of uh, twenty-eight. Um, pretty well represented. Yeah. Yes. 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 And if I'm not sure what you picked up from the uh, when I read through the, those descriptions, but a lot of them were wealthy. Um, uh, many of them were leaders in the church. I think uh, I think some other descriptions I was reading in the uh, another commentary. Now, Dwight, I think it goes back to that. There's a lot of scripture that talks about. The females were often, and with Paul, were fundraisers that uh, always was uh, giving money to the church when you mention wealthy. Uh, so it's like in a, being a fundraiser, sometimes you convince the lady first and then you uh, can get more, more money by going there yeah, first. Getting the husbands. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they talked about uh, some, a couple of women, and I can't find it on this other list here, that about, were apostles. Uh, one was a, a deaconess, though. Um, well, a lot. I mean, one and some of it is other writings other than this. I mean, he talks about um, women not being in leadership roles, and again, uh, and we, we we talked at that time that that was mainly for uh, those where the culture was very. Um, had women as property and so in order to keep the gospel going forward he wasn't going to address those issues right at that moment but if you look about what what he did and the, the groups that he had women were in leadership roles they were uh sometimes uh maybe the uh, unless they were royalty or they'd been married to royalty or maybe uh, and sometimes uh uh, their husbands may have uh, passed and they inherited a lot of that wealth, but uh, he had a lot of, uh, of people that supported women that supported his ministry. They hosted, uh, uh, might even have been pastors uh, in some of the house churches or, uh, that Paul's talking about here. So, um, so they had multiple roles in the church and in the ministry. And so uh, how many were slaves? And uh, I just highlighted them as green. So uh, just so you can see there was, you know, there's four or so 
uh, in this group that Paul called out. Um, and I don't know, it was, I was trying to think whether Urbanus was that one that uh, in Philemon or something, or who was a slave that Paul, that runaway slave that Paul had met. And then uh, he became a Christian and then Paul wrote a letter, was that Philemon? Wrote a letter to his master to accept him back as a brother in Christ and encourage the slave to go back. I don't know. So, so again, this just kind of shows the breadth of all the people involved in the ministry and and how the uh, the salvation uh, by Christ was for all peoples, all roles, all positions in society. It was an SMS, was Paul's the, the slave. Okay. Thanks. So, although Paul had never been to Rome, what does this greeting show about his perception of the church? Well, the interesting thing to me, I know, and I don't know why, it, it, um, I always just thought that, but when you think about Romans and you, you look at Galatians and you look at uh, Ephesians and all these others, uh, Paul's writing uh, letters to churches that he founded. But here in Romans, he didn't start that church in Rome. It sounds like a lot of this was started by some of the 70 that Jesus sent out years before this. So he, he's, his letter to the Romans is actually to a, a church that's already established, a Christian community that's already set up in Rome. So did all of you, rest of you already know that? I, I don't know whether uh, just kind of occurred to me that that was not a church that Paul started because these people he's addressing are people in Rome that are already Christians and have a lot of uh, home-based churches. Okay. Well, at least we now know the names of some of the 70. I don't remember that from before. No, I don't think they were listed. Uh, necessarily were they? right no but yeah. you're you referenced them here right at least yeah so yeah. there must be some kind of genealogy that points back to them yeah i guess that's a another thing to get into it at some point but yeah um and i think even and one one of the things that some uh even made it to britain yeah so, uh, britain so that's kind of amazing really so So what does Paul warn believers about in verses 17 through 18? And I'll, I'll read it for those that are currently driving. I urge, Thanks, you brothers, yeah. I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Was Paul preaching to today's politicians? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> and you kind of an answered that. So, so I'm going to read uh, this next part. Uh, relates to verse 19, and I'll reread that for, for everyone. It says, everyone has heard about you and these people that he's just listed, your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. 
and I had kind of trouble understanding that um, part there. Um, be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Well, same kind of phraseology is used in a couple other places, and I'll read that for you. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 14 20, and I am reading from the message translation, which you, you know, is, uh, and this is the, uh, the version that that Pastor Jeff used to preach from, didn't he? I think Steve, you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it's a very contemporary type of language and setup. So, uh, from the message in, in the First Corinthians, it says, "To be perfectly frank, I'm getting exasperated with your infantile thinking. How long before you grow up and use your head, your adult head?" It's our right to have a childlike unfamiliarity with evil. A simple no it is all that is needed there. But there's far, far more to saying yes to something. Only a mature and well-exercised intelligence can save you from falling into gullibility. And in Matthew um, 10, verse 16, and this is a more typical translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as harmless as doves. So, <clears throat> with these two, three, two passages and the last part of verse 19, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. How, how do you understand uh, that passage? I mean, it's almost a wa uh, a warning about testing, right? Test what you hear to the word, right? Right. You know, don't, I mean, because people are pretty, pretty convincing. Yeah, I think, too, you say with the childlike unfamiliarity, really, we, you don't have to know a lot about evil to know that it's wrong, necessarily. So you, you don't need to investigate it or try and mull it over your head. You, I think he, he's kind of saying, you know within your heart whether yeah. that's evil, so don't dwell on it. Right. Just right. say no. Yeah, listen to your heart. Yeah, that's listen good. Your heart, so or your conscience or the yeah. whole spirit or however we want to call that. So I think you kind of have to be careful about a trap about being innocent about what is evil. If you're so innocent, you might be rather unfavorably impressed the wrong way too. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I thought, you know, when I first read that, I thought couldn't, uh, didn't have a good understanding about it, but uh, I mean, the message translation, when Paul's re restating this in certain says, uh, you know, you know, you, you learn about God, you've got a good head on your shoulders, just, Use your adult head. Don't be like a, a child, but the, who can recognize evil, and you just need to say no. And it's that that simple. So, you know, Billy Graham used to talk about this scripture, and he'd say, "Don't be so concerned about what you don't understand. Be more concerned about what you do understand." Yeah, that's a yeah, that's great. That's another mm -hmm. uh, way to say it. So. What encouragement did Paul give the people in their struggle with evil in the world? And it, it kind of relates, and Chris, you guys can't see it. Excuse me. But verse 20 of that passage says, the great, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Well, he's kind of warning, warning us all. Uh, <clears throat> pay attention to what's going on. Don't get um, fooled, I guess. <clears throat> all right. In the last section, and uh, just for the, those uh, driving, I'll just I'm going to read through the last section again, and. Uh, and I'll repeat verses as we need to answer the question. So 
So in verse starting verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, to Lucius, Jason, and Sophit Patter, my relatives. I, Tetris, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings of the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, three of those, oh, I think this is just a statement, so it's not a question. Um, three of those sending greetings to the church in Rome were among those listed in Acts 20, verse 4, as part of Paul's traveling partners on the way to Jerusalem. So if you remember, before he was going to, he wrote this letter uh, to the church in Rome, and he says, so I'm going to come over there, but I, on my way to Spain, uh, but first we got to take this money to the uh, the church in Jerusalem. So, in Acts, it talks about this. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of uh, Pyrrhus from Marie, Antichrus, uh, Secutus from Thessalonia, and Gaius from Derb, Timothy, and Tychus from Trophius from Asia. So, that was just a statement, not a question. Okay, what similarities do we see in verse in 25 to 27? And I'll reread those and this Romans passage, uh, another Romans passage. So this is the ending of Romans. It says, now to him is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. So what similarities seem to that passage and the first five verses of Romans, the, the book of Romans that we, we started into, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. So do you see any similarities or the focus of... Uh, these two sections. Jesus. Paul, to me, like a... Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Paul was like a lawyer. He, I mean, when it comes to when we talk about how he lined things up, it was like exhibits in a courtroom that the similarities and, and the prophetic uh, evidence to show that uh, all this was for real. And uh, it didn't just you know, like nailing jello to the wall. It was very concrete. Yeah, it's kind of like, and, and I th I'm glad you mentioned that, um, Gary, because it's kind of like the first part of Rome is like his opening statement in a courtroom. Yeah. And then the, the 25 to 27 is kind of the summation. So, so he's heard all this testimony. And, and for this reason, as we stated at the beginning, uh, give glory to God forever and ever. So uh, I think there was a. So what has God done that is so wise that makes him deserving of glory? So to the only wise God be glory forever through Christ Jesus. So what has he done? And so those of you that are, are not driving can maybe see 
in this last <laughs> section may be determined. Or maybe those of you not driving cannot. <laughs> I could use some help on this one, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me pull over and read that and then answer it. <laughs> so now, well, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so all nations might believe and obey him to the only wise God be glorious. So what Paul's just kind of saying here is that he told us about it and the whole old testament proclaims that a messiah is coming salvation is coming uh, you're going to be rescued um, when these mysteries have been hidden in the old testament and with the prophetic writings uh, and we've talked about this uh, several times on how it's it's god's plan was revealed from the very beginning from the garden of eden uh, from uh, when they kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, but he told uh, Satan that uh, you're going to nip at the son of man's heel, but he's going to crush your head. So, um, and that's the first mention of it. The first blood sacrifice, you know, was made. The animals were killed. And uh, so that God could make um, Adam and Eve clothes of animal skins instead of the leaves that they tried to cover their nakedness with. So it's all tied together and it's the wisdom of God. He revealed it from the very beginning of what his plan was. So, I mean, I'd, I'd probably go a step further and say he's since the, since the garden, he's been pursuing his people with love and grace nonstop. Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. And still continues today. Yeah, and it's just, and you've heard me talk about it's, you know, we, we're God's people, and even America was kind of, it's God's uh, country. I mean, it was founded on that basis. So, I mean, people will, will argue that that's not the case. But if you look at the pilgrims when they came over, it was, uh, it was for religious freedom. Um, so, um, Anyway, there's one other uh, thing I wanted to, uh, these personal uh, reflection questions, uh, we'll maybe come back to them in a minute, but uh, I'll just read through them. What are some of the teachings that divide the church today? Uh, how do you work for a balance between the desire for unity and the desire to maintain truth? How do you handle individuals who cause strife and division as in verses 17 and 18? Avoid them, talk about them, confront them, worry about them, or pray for them. Uh, what can you or your group do to increase your participation in God's plan to lead all nations to believe and obey him? Do you view, view this task as more as a grim duty or as a tremendous privilege? What does this show you about your heart attitude towards the gospel? And what does it mean to you that in these final chapters, God is described as the God of hope in chapter 15, the God of peace in chapter 15 and in 1620. And how can we know God in this way, especially since Paul began this letter by revealing the God of wrath? So some things to maybe think about. Oh, this is things, some things to think about. So this kind of relates back to verses 17 and, and 20. So I'll just uh, read this and... Uh, so in Paul's words can be found the kernels of the Genesis story of the fall. Not so much to claim that Paul is mirroring that story, but enough to suggest its presence as a constant paradigm in Paul's thinking. Adam and Eve were taught the truth. The Roman believers are reminded of the teaching they've learned. Adam and Eve should have kept away from the one who came to tempt them. The Roman believers are warned to watch out for and keep away from those who would lead them astray. The one who deceived Adam and Eve was not serving God but himself. The Roman believers are warned that their tempters are not serving our Lord Christ but their own appetites. 
Adam and Eve were deceived by smooth talk. The Roman believers were warned to be aware of smooth talk and flattery. Just as God pronounced the ultimate doom of the one who deceived Adam and Eve, so Paul repeats that promise to the Roman believers. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Remember that back to the Genesis story, uh, your heel, you will not nip at your heel, but you will crush him with your foot. So, in the midst of his warnings, Paul reaffirms his joy, first mentioned in Romans 1 8, over their faith and obedience. But he does not want them to be naive about their faith. His wise sophists about what is good and innocent, and again, these are Greek words, Eric about what is evil, parallels Jesus' words to his disciples when he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Again, that same thing that he just talked about here. So from a different direction is similar to what he told the church. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. The life of faith must be received with the innocent and purity of the faith of a child, but lived in the maturity and reality of an adult who knows there is a war going on, which we can't talk about. The harshness of Paul's words will soon crush is cast in stark contrast to the backdrop of his earlier declaration. I am full of joy. Both are true in the Christian life, joy in the midst of war. The joy comes from knowing that the war has been and will be won. Our part and the Roman church's part is to be alert and vigilant until the final armatus. It is the grace of God that empowers us to understand, stand in, and stand in the conflict. Paul then lays out the wisdom of God in the gospel. Paul preaches a long hidden mystery has been revealed so that all the people of the earth might reclaim the obedience to God lost in the garden by Adam and Eve. Okay. Any other? It seems, it seems, it seems to me, and I'm being critical here, and I know that, but uh, our national church seems to be more interested in attempting to solve social problems than they are in following the scripture for the rest of us to lead our lives by. Yeah, and that's kind of, uh, I don't know, not, not the proper word, but, uh, you know, the the gospel is the solution to all the problems of society. Yep. And to think that uh, it, it is not... Um, is you know I mean when they keep uh, calling out the church is the the problem uh, which you hear a lot of people talking about today is that the Bible's out of date it has no meaning or relevance to uh, oh yeah today. but it does it's the answer to all all the the crap and stuff that we're facing today it's kind of like you remember the old ad years ago Ford has a better idea well we we got the national church saying we've got a better idea. So it seems. Yeah. Well, we, we've talked. Yeah. So. Um, I saw a commentary just this week. It's funny how that you were saying that, Dwight, is that if we would only follow what Jesus has taught us, we would have no problems. Right. <laughs> Too simple, Gary. Yeah. 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 We're no different than the Israelites. All those years of, you know, falling away and worshiping Baal and then coming back to God, you know, it's just, it's the yin and the yang that's been going on forever. Yep. Yeah. You know, and it's. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, we need to have that moment when we would, uh, if my people who will just uh, call upon my name. Right, right. Save their land, so. Yep. And humble themselves, yeah. Humble, yeah. yeah. And that's yep. the thing to humble yourselves, you know. You know yeah. yeah. Guys, so. sorry about that. There was so much participation. My phone went into emergency mode and overheated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, kidding you. <laughs> uh, hot, hot, uh, stuff, huh, hot stuff, huh, Chris? Hot stuff. 
I had to hold it in front of the air conditioning vent to get it to turn back on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I like right. to burn it up. Yeah, all right. Yeah. There must be truth in what we said today, Chris. Must because have been Satan, Satan wanted to melt that film of yours. Yeah. <laughs> Got your asbestos gloves? Yeah, huh. absolutely, wow. I do. Yeah, we your uh, son-in-law have to see what uh, what it's like on uh, to see the visuals. Yes, <laughs> might make it might look a little clearer. And, well, we put the, we we put the dog to sleep in the back, and Darwin and I are just overheating the phone listening. That's the problem. Yeah, there you go. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my uh, we always have a joke among my son-in-laws about uh, who's my favorite. So we well, always. This is my future son-in-law. So in September, he becomes my son-in-law. So between now and then, we have to have some conversations. <laughs> yeah, there you go <laughs> well has he asked for your daughter's hand in marriage he has he has so it, it done it in a very graceful manner well great yeah i don't uh i've told stories about my son-in-laws doing that process always very nervous and and everything and i think the uh the classic was a craig uh uh, Rachel's husband when he you know so we went through the whole thing I mean actually uh, when he did it it was Susan and I and and Rachel's uh, sisters were all there in the same room but so he went through his spiel and told about the the ring and everything else the whole story and then I said and we said yes and I said so what was what's going to happen what were you going to do if I I didn't uh, uh, say yes and he then he pulled out a a large bottle of Grey Goose. <laughs> <laughs> Bribery. Uh, yeah. Right away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's a man who had a backup plan. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. So, yeah. You know, let, let's face the facts of the, of the guys here that, you know, have, have buried their daughters off. We have to put on that tough, hard face when, when, the future son-in-law asked, but in the back of our minds, we're thinking, can you take her tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> She's crossed me a lot of money. <laughs> Let's pass that savings on somewhere else, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I had what the daughters, I mean, it's not, uh, this is probably uh, wrong sometimes, but um, I've done the thing where I've, uh, I've greeted him, uh, not, I don't think it was Craig, but one of the others uh, in you know, what they, you know, a tank top, you know, and everything else back when I was in, in good shape. And and one of my daughters told me, Dad, so-and-so is afraid of you. And I said, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good thing. So I took, got, a black, I took a black magic marker and tattooed all my arms up so I could wash it off afterwards. Let him think I was really, really. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it, it looked a little funny though when I put that Mike Tyson tattoo around my eye. It, it didn't look like. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. Yeah. No. I, the girls all ended up with uh, uh, great guys, which I'm sure your future son-in-law is too. Um, uh, but uh, which we're very grateful for uh, on, on one of my daughters. I mean, so we're glad she finally got to the uh, guy she married. Uh, some of the other uh, guys were not so uh, we were not so enamored with. But uh, well, guys, he's a he's an architect. He's actually working on the uh, the addition to the uh, IU Methodist Hospital downtown. So. So yeah, he's got a lot. He's got a lot going for him. Well, great. So I don't know whether uh, what firms he worked for. Here, I'll let you talk to him for a second. Uh, what was that? Yeah, what firm do you work for? I work for uh, Meticulous Design, but we're working in conjunction with uh, Ratio Architects, BSA Life Structures, and CSO Architects. Okay. So yeah. it's a joint venture called Curious Design. And yeah, so, no, you know, like, like it's, it's a phenomenal project and it's a great experience to kind of be a part of this whole process, just being able to work side by side with 
a lot of these uh, world-renowned uh, architects. Yeah, no, it is. It's a great project. I'm working on that too, on a part of it. So was on the cup and I've been in some of the MEP meetings. And uh, so, yeah, it's exciting. exciting. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been working on the uh, EMS area. Like I was working on the on pedestrian what? bridges right now. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking, uh, there's some concern about some of the tunnels going from the hospital and their proximity to uh, where the steam line crosses them on Senate Avenue. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting things going on there, so. Absolutely, definitely a lot of work, um, moving parts all around and, but overall, I, I feel like it's a great team. Um, even with, with so many people working on it, like, you know, like it, it's great to see everything coming together little by little. So do you work, are you sometimes down at the Med Tower? Yeah, I'm actually at the Med Tower Tuesdays through Thursdays. Okay, so. yeah, sometimes I occasionally have to walk over there, so. Okay. Maybe I'll look, I'll try and look for you maybe next time I'll come through, so. Yeah, for sure. I'm usually on the ninth floor um, on the north end, so. Okay, all right, great. Well, nice to meet you. I look forward to meeting you um, in person yeah, nice at some point. You I'll get you connected, Dwight. All right, great. All right, so uh, we're looking at our prayer list here. Um, so, oh, yeah, you know, if your future son-in-law might want to come to that October thing, I think I, I do have a spot. Yeah, you may put him in there. All right, I'll, I'll pencil him in, and like I said, the tickets will go out closer to the October event, so. Perfect. All right, so we've got uh, um, our, stand, our, our prayer list where we're at now. Um, uh, I think, uh, did you give us a update on Brad earlier? I think you did. I did, I did. Everything is progressing fine for the ones who did not hear that. So he's, he's home and moving from wheelchair to walker and walker to uh, crutches. So it's just, uh, it's gonna be a two or three year process. I'm sure of that. Okay, great. Um, uh, any other things to add or updates? I don't know, we haven't seen Greg for a couple weeks. Do you know, have you talked to him, Steve? I have not. Okay, well, yeah, you've been gone too, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think. Go ahead. No, I said usually the ladies get together on Thursday night, but they didn't get together last night, so didn't get an update. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, and Susan, I may want to talk to you about that trip. I mentioned, well, she knew you guys were going, so she said, "Yeah, we ought to do that sometime." So. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. And I guess Gary's been. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so no specific updates on any any other updates or additions. Uh, we might want to put down uh, Frank Grunewald. Um, he's our Holocaust survivor who's been a pilgrim and spoke to our super seniors group several times, uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, we found out that, and Dick, you have to correct me, um, found out it was a, there's a little bit of a, a tumor in the uh, pancreas, which a Dr. House, well-renowned doctor who does a lot of this type of surgery, um, spoke to Frank and said, uh, uh, let's go ahead and do the surgery. And Frank said, well, what are the odds of, of doing the surgery? And he goes, I'm 98% confident that I can get that out. Yeah. And so those are pretty good odds for a 94-year-old Holocaust survivor. He said, well, even if you don't, I've lived my life well, go for it. Yeah, he, he, he made the comment to us the other day, uh, Carol and me, that uh, he says, I almost died at age 12, and here I am at 90. What have I got to lose? Yeah. yeah. He's a pretty amazing guy. Yeah, that he has an amazing story. That's, yeah. that's for sure. So, 
All right. Uh, so let's, let's spend a moment in prayer. Uh, Chris, you don't have to close your eyes. <laughs> All right. There, and Father, um, we thank you so much for your word and, and your blessings uh, that you give to us, our families, and our children and grandchildren. We ask you to continue to be uh, active uh, in our lives. Let us feel your presence in a very real and personal way. Thank you, God. 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 Father, we just uh, ask you continue to be with uh, those on our list to bring uh, uh, rapid healing and, and mobility, uh, full mobility back to, to Brad um, so that he can be cycling again soon and uh, uh, just be with uh, Anna. We ask you bring uh, uh, healing and, and full restoration to her as she deals with MS. Um, we think of those others on our list, uh, the Holocaust survivor, uh, uh, what a miracle just to, to be at this point in his life and uh, and have that option to to uh, for that surgery uh, we just ask the surgery be successful and uh, you bring him uh, many more years uh, he continued to sell his story to uh, to those so that we can re remember and uh, learn lessons from his experience father you know this the state of our nation and i know there's many people crying out to you for for mercy and your restoration and 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 uh, just to get rid of this evil we ask for your protection on our children and grandchildren and you know they are, are under attack right now so uh, and families are under attack and christianity is under attack uh, father we just ask for your release come lord jesus we ask these things in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 So interesting, you mentioned uh, Billy Graham, and I, I don't uh, have all the materials yet, but we're going we're gonna to start in Esther uh, next week. Um, so it should be an interesting study that God's not mentioned in the book of Esther, but his presence is, is, is there. So... Um, it's a situation much like we're, we're in today. Um, and, and Esther is a, a, a Jewish and a, a Gentile situation, but uh, it's not acting for a long time, but then uh, finally it's kind of called upon to uh, act. So uh, there, there's so many similarities. I, I just thought we had to uh, get into it. So there's also, and I don't know what the connection is, but I, I will, I ordered a couple books, um, but there's some connection between the, the dates that the body of Billy Graham lied in state uh, in the rotunda and the book of Esther. So mm. it's a mystery that we will uh, explore and I don't know what that is yet, but um, we'll see. So anyway, have a blessed week. Uh, we got... Uh, Actually, we've got Gus's, uh, my one grandson's uh, birthday party, and uh, actually at that party, I'm going to I'm going to baptize uh, Maggie, Rachel's second child. So nice. um, that should be a right uh, interesting experience. So it's answering my my kids too. I think Phoebe wants uh, no, not Phoebe. Abby wants uh, Pastor Jeff to baptize her baby when it's. It's going to be uh, induced, I think, um, uh, July 7th. So ask for your prayers that this go, that goes well. So anyway, have a great week. And uh, Chris, it's, it's nice uh, seeing you. Uh, Good morning. Keep your eyes on the road, buddy. And, uh, <laughs> and, it's always, always and I, I look forward to meeting your uh, son-in-law in person. Nate White. Yeah. Can you see right by me? <laughs> hey, guys. hey hey how are you, I'm good to you. Well, we're, we're great good guys love y'all see you i'll see you chris, 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 chris. Care. bye 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 guys hey steve hey how are you debbie good steve just got back from their cruise in alaska oh wow what a beautiful trip huh yeah
Yeah. 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 No yeah. rain and sun every day, which is very unusual up there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that's on that's on his uh, bucket list. So. Yeah. Well, yep. it was a fun time. A good yeah. one. Anyway, well, it's good to see you guys. I'm just getting ready for work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Have you. a great day. Yeah. Have a good one. See you guys. Bye-bye. Have Take a good care. holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy 4th.